This will be our ninth uh, lesson in the book of Ephesians. And this is uh, groundwork. What we're covering tonight is continued groundwork in the epistle. Now, unlike the works of men and human purposes and determinations, what God does, particularly in salvation, the salvation is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory, is best understood by knowing him. In fact, the, the less you know him, the less you know about what he's doing. Amen. I want to stress this because you can't, nobody is smart enough to figure out what the Bible's talking about if they don't understand God himself Amen. and how he works. We're going to touch on some of those things uh, tonight. In fact, it's impossible to understand salvation, at least fully, or to any measurable extent, if you don't know God. Now, you'll have to examine your own life, but I know you were in Christ a long time before you knew what really happened. And I also know that when you found out what happened and you kind of blow it, blossomed out to it, it's because you understood God himself. Now, in our day, it's a very dangerous day to, to be living in because there's very little understanding of God himself. People are confused by what God does. God will do something like a calamity like he did at the flood and the Tower of Babel and Sodom and Gomorrah and Jerusalem and a host of other, Egypt and a host of other calamities he wrought, and they're confused by the whole thing. Calamity happens and they fall apart. Why did it do that? See, there's an ignorance of God that prevails. That it prevails in the in the world, we expect that. But it's dominant in the church, the professed church, the American church in particular, and most of the rest of the world too, because the American church is the one that founded these other churches. And we've mentioned to you some of us who have traveled. It's like little American churches. <laughs> The difference is the people are sincere, but they just hardly know anything at all. I, in fact, I've asked some respected missionaries if they know of just one, just one, in the whole world, one foreign church that's stable, that's grown up into Christ. Now, I understand the people that I talked with don't represent the whole world, world, but none of them could name one. And I knew I couldn't name one. I know Brother Gene, Brother Aaron, Brother Ricky has been, have been exposed to this firsthand with myself. The people are sincere. They have faith. It's just that they don't know much. They haven't been taught hardly anything at all. That's the kind of situation we're addressing in the book of Ephesians. That's exactly the situation here. It wasn't that the people didn't have faith. The world had heard about their faith. Uh -huh. Their faith and their love for the saints had been broadcasted around the world, and I can tell you there's not a church in this geographical area that that can be said about that I know of, I, put, I better put a qualifier on there, that I know about. They did. Church at Colossae was the same way. People heard, Church at Rome was the same way. People heard about these churches, about their faith and about their love to the saints. They heard about it all over the world. And yet these people didn't know some things that needed to be known. And so Paul's writing to them about it. When you come into Christ, <coughs> admittedly, you don't know much. 
But all you know is what you're supposed to do. <laughs> to be saved. And a lot of you don't know much beyond that. But as you grow, this uh, your, your insight enlarges and you begin to understand more because you understand the God of salvation. See, God tells you what the bottom line is. For instance, when people were first come into Christ, they're told simplistic, simplistic things. Repent and be baptized. All right, that's about as simple as you can get. Why tarryest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? Call on the name of the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Here is water. If thou believest, thou mayest be baptized. See, people that are coming into Christ... The teaching is simplistic by its very nature. But when these same people, after 5, 10, 15 years, this is still all they know, well, let me be right up front with you. It's not going to go well with the preachers that brought these people to this condition. If these preachers are even saved in the end, I'll be surprised. Because inasmuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, my brethren, Jesus said, you did it not unto me. I don't care who the minister is or who the teacher is or who the professor is. If they've become tolerant of infantile believers and have not helped them grow up into Christ, well, I wouldn't exchange shoes for them for anything. You notice that Paul didn't let this situation continue. If he's writing to a church that had actually embraced another gospel, like the Corinthians had left the gospel. They embraced another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Did Paul like grow accustomed to this and say, oh, there they are. They departed from the faith. Oh, no. He corrected the situation. Church of Galatia. Embraced another gospel, which is not another. Did Paul let it go? No. Did he say, I preached there to him, I spent time there, that's enough? No. He corrected the situation, at least he endeavored to do so. He was faithful in doing this. Listen, there are some people that are like people of Old Testament times. They don't know that what God is doing is conforming his people to the image of his son that he has never determined anything else. From, from day one in eternity, so to speak, that was his determination to make the people like Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And then he gives you four Gospels that tells you what Jesus is like. And if you see a correlation between the average Christian and the Jesus of the Gospels, you have severe mental problems. There isn't any correlation. Paul sees that. He's going to instruct the people. Now, I'm not just trying to be critical here. Understand, this is the burden with which I live. And I spend my life to try and correct these misapprehensions. Some people don't even have any apprehensions, let alone misapprehensions. They don't know about these things. A common error of our times is that thinking is thinking that conformity to Christ takes place by responding to divine requirements. If you just do what you're told to do, that makes you like Jesus. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. And if you're honest, you know that. You are made like Jesus by transformation. You are changed by the Holy Spirit from one stage of glory, yeah. increasing glory to another. 2 Corinthians 3.18. But here's the catch to it all. This is, doesn't happen like automatically. In the background, God does this no matter what. This happens through your understanding of God himself. Amen. That's the secret. The less you know of God, the less work's going to be done in you. Because it's through the knowledge of God, as is explicitly taught in Scripture, it's through the knowledge of God that the conformity takes place. Amen. So he's going to tell us God's role in salvation. One of the primary ministries of Jesus to his people is in 1 John 5.20. 
We know the Son of God is come. Now, a lot of versions say has come. Is come is proper. What it means is he's come and he's still here. <laughs> That's what is come means. Has come could mean he came but he left. But he, he is come. He is right. He is come and has given us an understanding that we might know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and everlasting life. 1 John 5.20. And what does the next verse say? Keep yourselves from idols. Make sure you've got the right God. I'm, impl I'm imploring you to do this. Each person is responsible for himself. You must know for yourself. Do I know the, the, the God that Jesus teaches about? Is that the one I know about? Well, we'll learn a little bit about him, about this God tonight. Our text is the ninth verse of chapter 1. <coughs> Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself... Look at how many references you have to deity again. His will, his good pleasure, he hath purposed in himself. See, it's, <laughs> it's all about God. If you were to plot through all the verses thus far, you'd find it over and over and over and over again. He talks about what God and God and Christ and God and Christ. And that's the, that's the subject he's talking about. What's he doing? He's opening up God and Christ. Because they're the ones that cause salvation to happen. Why do they cause it to happen? That's what we're going to, going to touch on tonight. Having made known unto us. See how God has conducted himself in strict keeping with his own character and purpose. God doesn't do anything that's unlike himself. God doesn't do anything that is contrary to what he purposed before he made the world. Everything is in keeping with that. Which means it's God's nature to divulge himself. This is God's, this is what God does. But it's, only, it's not to everybody. It's just to people who are humble and contrite in spirit. People in particular who believe the record he's given of his son. He shows himself to them. Because see, nobody can be saved that doesn't know God. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's categorically stated in 2 Thessalonians 1 that when Jesus comes, he's going to destroy them that know not God. See, so that's serious business. Not about God, not, not what he means. It doesn't mean an academic textbook type list out the things about God. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about familiarity with God. Acquainted with God is how the book of Job puts it. Being familiar with his ways. Let's put it this way. When God made coats of skin for Adam and Eve, that's just like him to do that. When God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden, that's just like him. That's just that's the, what he does. Amen. When God put a curse on Cain, that's that's what that's what God does. He acted in strict conformity with his character. When God blessed Seth, that's that's just exactly how God operates. When God called Abraham, that's that's how he operates. When he rejected Ishmael, that's God. That's how God is. When he accepted Isaac, that's how God is. See, all through the text of Scripture, when he destroyed the Midianites, that's what God does. He sent the flood. That's it perfectly in keeping with who he is. When he saved Noah, that's perfectly in keeping with who he is. See, everything in the Scripture is telling you something about God. So you want to play games? You don't do it with God. Amen. You want to ignore God? You won't get by with it. Amen. You want to run to God? He'll not ignore that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You're humble and contrite of heart. You say, I want you, Lord, more than anything else. God won't turn his back on that. It's just like him to honor that sort of person. He acts in accordance with his character strictly. Grace is an expression of his character. And wrath is an expression of his character. They both are. Both in keeping. He's going to make known his wrath. 
Now he's making known his grace. Both of them are in strict keeping with his character. Now our text says, having, having made known. That is to say, this is something that's already happened. Now some of the translations read it differently. He has, the newer Revised Standard Version said that's, that's good. Making, American Standard Version, that means he has and he's still, still doing it. That he might, as a do a version. That's if you understand that he did these other things so he could do this or that, but it's still kind of loose. When he, the good news about it says when he, or that is in the past, but that's a little that's a little too vague. He did this, the net Bible says. The good news, uh, the message Bible says, setting us in on, letting us in on, that's a little vague. If you're in Christ tonight, what we're going to talk about now is something that has already happened. Yeah. Whether you know it or not, that's phase two. <laughs> that's phase two. Whether you know it or not. But this is having made known. This is an elaboration of the expression, he is abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. You know, he's going to ex comma or semicolon. Now he's going to elaborate on that. Have it made known unto us. That's something in the abounding. He's making something known to us. He's making something understandable to us. Some people think of the abounding grace as he just loves us so much he doesn't condemn us. Well, all right, if a beer had new in Christ, we can, we can handle that for a while, but it's got to get beyond that. The abounding grace has got to get beyond overlooking what you are. Uh -huh. And honestly, there's some people that they never get beyond this, and none of us can say we're worthy. I understand that. But when he's talking about abounding here, he's talking about God unveiling himself in increasing measures. It started out when the, when the door of salvation was open, this started right, right there. The moment you were put into Christ, it started right there. God began making known. Now, he did it through means. He does it ultimately through Christ. He does it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He does it through the apostles and prophets. He does it through the scriptures. But he does it. Amen. There's no house in the world that was built by an independent hammer. Everybody knows this. Nobody would say, well, there's a hammer floated around and put that house together. But there are some people that think grace works like an independent hammer. It's God is the one that wields it. He's the one that makes it come to pass. The magnitude, put it another way, the magnitude of his salvation was discerned when what f follows was made known to us. That is to say, when you see the results of salvation, that's when it's made known to you. When your conscience is pure, when you're growing in Christ, when your appetites are changed, when your loves are changed, when you're transformed in the way you think, Amen. that proves he's made known Amen. something to you. It's something that occurred in the past. If a person didn't benefit from it, it wasn't because God wasn't on the initiative. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Matter of fact, a lot took place right when you first come into Christ. You've you saw that you needed Christ. That was something for yeah. some people. It took years for them to see that. But they saw it. The message coupled with our faith opened the fountain of spiritual understanding. That's what he's talking, that's what he's talking about. God having made known to us. Made known. Now there are at least two ways in which something is made known. That is you end up knowing it. A person can uh, can view the gospel of Christ, God's power and salvation, as the means by which he knows it. The gospel 
proclaims it, it elaborates on it as one way of knowing it. It can be seen as a message that informs us of what is required for us to come to God. And there's a sense in which that's true. But this is a deeper, deeper tutelage. This is some, This is not, as Brother uh, Ricky has used this phrase, classroom learning or blackboard learning. It isn't that kind of learning. It's more than a person knows how to be a carpenter. You know, uh -huh. they can actually do the work. Uh -huh. That's the kind of knowledge we're talking about here. You can know God, therefore you could pray to Him intelligently. You can receive from Him. You can specify things that you need, you can go to him because you know him. You know how he thinks. How, knowing how God is will change sometimes how you pray. I'm amazed that people, people pray a lot for little things. It's not that they're not important. It's not what I'm saying, but in view of eternity, you know, prayer should be uh, elevated. Matter of fact, sometimes some conditions we have to pray about over and over and over and over for an extended period of time, that may be because we don't have much enough knowledge of God to pray intelligently about the situation and why God should do something about it. This is the first having made known. This is the first of five references in Ephesians to God making something known. Now, the matter that he made known is never things of the world. It's not that he made known that a flood is going to happen in the year 52 B.C. or A.D. <laughs> it's not that type of thing. He's made known things like that, understand. Agabus foretold a drought that was going to happen in all the world. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about someone's prophesies a war is going to break out. Or... We don't deny that that's possible. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about things pertaining to this great salvation, the outpouring of God's grace. That's what he's making known to us. Now I think of some things he's already said that he made, he made known to us. He's made known to us that God's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Verse 3. How would you know that if God didn't tell that to you? How, how could you possibly know that God has put all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, provided them for you. If God didn't tell you that, how would you know it? Having made known, see? Or how about this? He has chosen us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Verse 4. How would you possibly know that if God didn't make it known? But he made it known. You're in because God wanted you in. That's the only reason you're in. Amen. Well, I have some trouble with that. Well, it's best to eliminate having trouble with it because that is what he said. God has made this known. He predestinated us to be adopted sons. He predetermined this. What he said, verse Amen. 5, how would you know this? if God didn't make it known. And even after God's make it known, people argue about it. <laughs> so I can't accept that. Well, we hardly recommend you change your mind on that. He's abounded toward us and has now made known that he's abounded toward us. See, how would you, how would you know this? If you were to study the average church, would you conclude God has really poured a lot out there? Would you really conclude that? Is this what anybody in the world concludes when they behold the average church? Are they impressed with how much God has done? Go ahead, Brother Tony. Let me interrupt your oh, go ahead. Uh, these are things that you don't figure out. <laughs> That's uh, exactly now, it. Now, I've read these. These are scriptures, that, and I've read these things for years and years and years, and, and even though they're printed yeah. right here for you to read, if you still have to have somebody yeah, to open it up to you. <laughs> I know now, it. That's, that's being made, making known. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, it's because God's doing it. See, it's, it's mm -hmm. not made known by an academic process. 
It isn't that if you study long enough and study hard enough, then it will be made known to you. It's God that makes it known. Amen. Listen, there's some people that have made a lifetime of studying the Bible who don't see these things. Oh, yeah. oh. And now some of them are academically honest people. But they don't see these things at all. Somebody God does, does it. A lot of people on that issue about God pouring, pouring out, it point to the big, the mega churches just on the basis of numbers. Numbers, yeah. Numbers of people, number, you know, budget numbers and things, and equate that with the outpouring of the Lord. But it must just be using the wrong criteria of judgment. That's right. Well, that's an academic look at it, see, yeah, that yeah. blesses us as to them a house and a car and, and on and on, t these things. But see, that's, this, they, they haven't, they, it may, has been made known to that's them. That's right. If they, don't, if they don't understand this is a different kind of blessing, it hasn't been made known to them. See, riches that can be taken from you aren't riches. Uh -huh. All riches, earthly riches, are going to be removed from everybody that's got them. You can't take them to the next world. You can't even take them into the grave. You can't take them. What he's talking about, you can take. Amen. That's what he's talking about. And he's made none unto us that his power is toward us as those who are in Christ. Not toward the elders, not toward the preachers, not toward the seminaries, Amen. not toward the professors, toward us. We're talking about the exceeding greatness of his power. That's what we're talking about. And there isn't anything in this world that is greater than God's power. What is it that God's power can't just do away with? He's made this known to us, that exceeding riches of his, the greatness of his power is toward us. So how would you know that if God hadn't made it known? You, you don't, would have concluded that. In fact, we didn't. <laughs> and he made known that he, that God loved past tense, loved us. How would you have known that if God didn't let you, let you know it? He loved us before the foundation of the world, but it was in Christ. And he, he quickened us, made us alive. I'm showing things that he's made known. He's made known the exceeding riches of his kindness toward us. He tells us in Ephesians he moved the middle wall or partition between Jews and Gentiles. He tells us in Ephesians that his mighty power works in us. And that everyone in Christ has given grace to every one of us. Amen. And that Christ also has loved us. These are things he's made known. Now, you'll notice that all of these things have to do with God's character. They're not fundamentally about your need, although you need them. There's <laughs> no question about you need them. But that's not what this is about. We talk yeah. about the necessity of these things being revealed. That the, the disciple John was there at the foot of the cross watching Jesus suffer and die. Yeah. But he did not understand what was going on in the unseen realm. That had to be opened up to him. So when Jesus That's met right. with the disciples, he says he opened up the scriptures unto them so that they could understand him. Amen. Had to be revealed. Even seeing the Savior suffer, Amen. he still didn't connect it with the things that had to be revealed. They thought it was the end, but it was really the beginning. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Now he says he's made known unto us. Who is us? <laughs> Someone might say, well, this is the apostles. Well, that's not too comforting. It's only 12 of them, <laughs> plus Paul. You mean all the billions of people that's lived, 13 people, the only people that got in on this? That's not be silly. This is so absurd, it's unworthy of even discussing such a thing. But some people do believe that. He showed it to us. The fact they forget is then that those men showed it, passed it on. See, what God gives... God doesn't personally give this knowledge to everybody. You have to get it through the vehicle through which he's made it known. In this case, he, he revealed something to Paul, and you've you got to get it from Paul. Listen, God will not show you what he showed Paul if you're unacquainted with Paul. 
You're going to have to hear his word. The people of the day of Pentecost, they had to hear what God showed Peter. Had to come from Peter then to them. This is how God works. He works through a messenger. He's so particular about it when he wanted to talk about the future. And he wanted to reveal it to John and the Isle of Patmos. God first gave it to Christ. This is in the first few verses of Revelation. He first gave it to Christ. Christ gave it to an angel. An angel gave it to John. And John gave it to the churches. Then the churches are to pass it on too. This is, this is God's nature. This is how God's... He doesn't thunder out of heaven and give a personal bit of knowledge to everybody. He makes it known to a responsible steward. Mm -hmm. Then the steward makes it known. So when Paul says, having made known, he knows it was made known to him. And so he's passionate. God's going to work through that message. He's going to work through that message that Paul gave. If you don't know the message that Paul gave, you won't, the work won't be done in you. That's, that's a, I don't know how you could come to any other conclusion. If you can, then there's no purpose for the apostles. It was given to them unto, unto us here refers to the body of Christ, not to the initial messengers. Now, that this, this is a word God wants us to know. Amen. What he's going to talk about in Ephesians is something the church, God wants the church to know. It's something they need to know. They need to know it so their salvation makes sense to them. So they're able to see where this thing is going. Because if you can see where this is going, you'll avoid a lot of pitfalls yeah. along the way. Yes. Pray this very thing in his prayer in John 17 when he said, yeah. Neither pray I these for these alone, yeah. referring to his apostles, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Amen. Amen. See, the family of God, now, of course, if a person has been taught that God regards everybody the same way and all this sort of thing, then this, this successfully obscures this truth. Because this is selective us this isn't humanity us this is those in Christ us yeah. so automatically you've got a selection process here some people are given to know it and some people aren't us yeah. now you want to be in the us category to be sure so Paul takes what's revealed to him he knows it's been revealed to him for the whole house. So he tells them, none of the redeemed are excluding are excluded from the dispensing of this bit of knowledge. If you're a young believer, it's for you. If you're an older believer, it's for you. If you're a new believer, it's for you. If you're a seasoned saint, it's for you. It's for us, the whole body, for us. All right, what is it that you made known? What is it that's made known, Paul? Having made known unto us <clears throat> the mystery of his will. Uh, some other versions say the secret of his purpose. That's pretty good. His secret plan. Jewish Bible. The mystery of his plan. Good news Bible. The mystery of his pleasure, murder, the secret of his will, the mystery of his purpose, his mysterious plan, his secret reason for sending Christ, the secret of what he wanted, the secret purpose of his will, his own mysterious ways, and the mystery secret of his will, of his plan, of his purpose. So this is not like real obvious. What is God doing? All right, if you ask 10 different Christians that question, you'll probably get 10 different answers. What is God doing in Christ? Well, someone might say, well, what he's doing is he's, he's making us successful in the world. He's, uh, he's, 
making our family solid. He's making our country solid. Oh, there's all kind of... <laughs> What is God doing? What is the purpose? It's a secret. Unless God tells people what he's doing, they're not going to come at it at all. Now, there are a number of references to, quote, the mystery in the apostolic writings. To the Romans, Paul refers to, pre to the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. That is, he preached Christ within the context of what God was doing, what God had purposed to do. He announced it by the prophets, but they didn't know what they were saying themselves. What was God doing? Christ is set in that purpose. Not in what you need, not in what you want. That's not the context for Christ. When you say Christ is the answer to your need, that's a wrong context. That's not the surrounding that you should give Christ. It's the purpose of God. That's, that's what defines Christ. Later in Ephesians, Paul will declare that the mystery was made known to him by revelation. So God just opened the thing up to him. Once he did, Paul could correlate it with Scripture. He was an expert at handling Scripture. But the key that unlocks the Scripture is the purpose of God. If you don't know what God's doing, your, your understanding of Scripture is superfluous. It's just, so what? It's just on the surface. You may be able to tell me what they need to do to raise their kids and what they need to do to be successful and be, have riches. And you tell them all about, well, so what? What you all said and done when you die, what did it amount to? What is God doing? The mystery of his, the, he revealed the mystery later in, Paul affirms that the per, per, affirms he had personal knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, Christ is not as plain as people make it out. If you say the word Jesus, it's not like a magic word. You've got to see him in God's purpose, what God has designed. Paul also states that he wrote in order to make all men see what's the fellowship of the mystery. In other words, God intends for people to participate in this mystery, which means it can't remain unknown. It has to be understood to some degree. He will ask the Ephesians to pray for him. In Ephesians 6, 19, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So that the gospel is made clear to people. What God intends in the gospel. What he's doing in the gospel. That's what makes it good news. It isn't good news because at last I found something I wanted. It, that may be true, but that's, that's too shallow. You need something better than that. Colossians 4.3, he also asked the Colossian brethren to pray for the same thing. He might speak the mystery. He declared in Colossians that the mystery had been hid from ages and generations. That there's whole generations of people that never did know this mystery. But it's now made manifest to his saints, meaning those there in Christ Jesus. Paul affirms that when the saints are knit together, it is in order to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. So when we all grow up into Christ, you grow up into Christ, then we, because we're grown up into Christ, we are knit together, then suddenly God and Christ are clarified. Now, they're not clear to everybody. Some people think they're the same person. They're the Jesus-only people. Other people, they, they, can't, they have a lot of trouble understanding why Christ is God and things like this. It's just a trouble area. But when you're knit together, you, grow, you personally grow up into Christ, you're knit together in love, yeah. then you acknowledge, that is, you know what this is all about. 
that God needs Christ more than you do. Amen. Okay, because if he doesn't have Christ, he can't pour out his mercy, which he wants to do. But he has to have Christ to do it. Amen. The mystery of it all. Say so that, no wonder people draw close to Christ. No wonder Paul said, I'll do anything. I'll forget the things that are behind. Yeah. And I'll press toward the mark. I want this one thing I do. I want to press toward the mark so I can know Christ, the fellowship of his sufferings, and the power of his resurrection. Yet by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Why did he want to do that? Because he saw who Christ was. Amen. He saw who God was. And that, that moved to press out. Why don't people do it today if they don't? Why didn't I do it when I was younger? Because I didn't know. I could have quoted Bibles since I was a young boy. A lot of scripture. But I didn't know the mystery. Didn't comprehend it. There's a time when God revealed to John in the Isle of Patmos. He said, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So God's purpose is going to be completed. <laughs> and here in Revelation, he, particularly verse chapter 21, he begins to unfold what it's going to be after the world's gone, after the day of judgment's gone, after the resurrection's gone. He reveals what's going to, and that, what's going to take place then is what now is all about. You take that away from the people, the then and there, and you've confused the here and the now. Mm -hmm. So as usually these texts that I just mentioned, the mystery refers to something that has been hidden from previous ages and generations, but is now made known. So it, it's not a mystery now. It's been made known now. It's not a mystery. You can't unravel this mystery by reading the scripture. It's not done that way. There's a lot of things that are answered by just reading the scripture. But this thing is opened up by God himself. And it doesn't mean you don't read the scripture. You understand what I'm saying here. But when the revelation comes, God gave it to you. Amen. It wasn't your study that brought it to Amen. you. Amen. Keep thinking about that text. That instead of Jesus, I will open my mouth in parables. Yeah. I will utter things hidden from the foundation, foundation of the world. That's right. And yet everybody didn't grasp it except those it was given, mm -hmm. given to. Now God made this mystery known to Paul. 1 Timothy 1.12 reminds us that God counted or considered Paul faithful. And so that text says he put him in the ministry because he knew he could, he, could count on, he could count on Paul. Now it's the same with Abraham. He said of Abraham, I know Abraham, he'll command his children after him. Whatever I tell Abraham, he'll, he'll pass it on. See, all people aren't like this, brother. All people aren't like this. Some people have had insights, but they kept them to themselves. They didn't pass it on. Paul was faithful. That's why God gave this to him. God opened it up to him because he knew it would impact Paul, and he'd open it up to others, and so we, that's, where, that's where we got it. We got it from him. How faithful are, are you with, the, no, with what you know? How faithful are you with it? See, that's, that's the question you've got to answer. Of his will, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Of his will. Jesus spoke of the mysteries of the kingdom. Paul spoke of the mystery of Christ. And the mystery of the gospel, and the mystery of God the Father and of Christ, the mystery of faith, the mystery of godliness. Here we're talking about the mystery of his will. See, it's not what you wanted that's the key. It's what God wanted, his will. The mystery of his will. All right, if all you had now was the first few books of the Bible, 
And you read about Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden. You read about Cain being cursed by God. And you read about the flood where everybody was destroyed. And you read about the Tower of Babel where everybody was, dis was dispersed. And you read about Sodom and Gomorrah. You, and you read about Egypt. <laughs> Judge of ten plagues. Would you conclude that God wanted to bless people? Would you have concluded that? See, some people, they say, well, that's, that's another God. That's a God of the Old Testament. But God hasn't changed. God has always wanted to bless people. That's why he struck out a plan, a purpose, that allowed him to be righteous and be gracious at the same time. Amen. <laughs> I tell you, Amen. only God could do this. Amen. He didn't have to forfeit any part of his character because he couldn't. He couldn't forget anything he was. He had, that had to be in place. So his purpose pertained to working this thing out to where he was both just and the justifier. He was not unrighteous in saving men. He was right, and this, this purpose, that's what it's ma he's making known. He's making known that, the, that he has declared his righteousness for the remission of sins. That categorical statement is in Hebrews, the third chapter. He declared his righteousness for the remission of sins. It is as righteous for God to forgive people. Hmm? And that's why Jesus, his primary ministry was toward God. That's right. Because tongue in cheek, God is unconditionally righteous. That's right. So he can't forgive without a righteous basis that's for right. forgiveness. Amen. Otherwise, a, if forgiveness was just brushing under the rug or looking the other way or what have you, then the day of judgment would just be bringing up what existed. The, the accuser of the brethren would have something to accuse. Amen. See, God, all along he purposed to have a people that would be perfect and without blame before him in love. That was kind of the long-range plan. Now, how to get there, <laughs> that was... That was the challenge. How to do this without compromising his own character. He revealed to Paul how he worked this thing out. And that's what Paul, that's what Paul reveals to us. But people see who don't study Paul, they don't study Paul's epistles, they, they don't know this. Because nobody else said this. No other inspired man wrote this. Go ahead. That's why Paul would say, when I think of this plan, I want to I fall on my knees. That's right. Because he was so... That's when, right. He, when he realized what God was doing... That's right. It, uh, he had this kind of... Reality. There was an enormous price tag for this, but the one who paid it was Christ. And he was cursed. Well, it was worse than that. He was made a curse. Galatians 3.13. When you realize what Jesus had to do, in order for God to be just in justifying us, well, I'll tell you, it makes you thankful. You'll live for Christ no matter what. I'm ready to die. Paul says, I'm ready. Amen. I'm crucified the world, the world in Christ under me, and I crucified the world, the world under me. Why? Because he saw this that we're talking about. Why is it some people keep on living for Christ, obstacle after obstacle, raises its head, and they seem to get past it. Keep on living for Christ. They, they, nothing seems to throw them back. It isn't because they're like super Christians. That isn't it. Because they see this that we're talking about. And even a vague sight of it will, will move a person to make alarming progress in this area, just if you just see some of it. But this this opens up more and more and more that there's not an angel in heaven, a demon in hell that can fault God for the way he saved people. Amen. Nobody can raise an accusation against God. God. The mystery of his will. See, <laughs> even after this has been made known in Scripture, there was a time in my life when I would, if someone would have asked me, how can God be righteous in saving men, it would have boggled in my mind. I wouldn't have known how to answer it. Because I just didn't, I didn't think this way. I had a church mind. <laughs> this isn't the way I thought. I just thought God loved me, of course. That's why. Well, it's a little bit deeper than that. A little bit, a whole lot deeper. A whole lot deeper than that. The mystery of his will. 
The mystery under consideration had particularly to do with what God wanted. In fact, God is the only person that really has complete free will. So men may want to argue about whether men have free will or not. I personally say, let's talk about God's free will. Because he did what he wanted. And you, to this day, can't always do what you want. Can you? To will is present with me, Paul said. But how to perform it? I don't, Does that sound like a free will? God's will is free. Mystery of his will. See, it's what God wants that determines what he does. Amen. God can't be forced into reacting to somebody. This isn't the way God is. He does it because he wants to do it or he doesn't do it. And what he's saying is there are some things I've always wanted to do. But I was unable to divulge it because there wasn't a high enough in spiritual intelligence quotient among men. I couldn't, I couldn't tell this to the prophets. They, they didn't know enough yet. I had to work and work and work. 1,500 years I worked under the law. 2,500 years before the law. And I showed certain people certain things. But I'm building, I'm building humanity so when I talk about this, they'll have a kind of a framework to work in. They'll know by the time Moses come, the world knew what God thought of sinners. There was no question about it. They knew what he thought about competing gods. They knew what he felt about people that would launch out on the midnight hour on his word, just move out of Egypt. And they found out God will sustain a, God will sustain a people like that. He'll see to it they have all they need to Make the trip, too. And all through these years, God's working with mankind. Purpose was all, all along existed. But he had to bring men up to speed so they could just see it and comprehend it. Now he's made it known because in Christ, everything that was against understanding has been moved out of the way. See, Jesus destroyed the devil, plundered principalities and powers, remove sin. He got rid of the obstacles so men can, they can kind of move about <laughs> and see a little bit clearer now what God has purposed all along. According to the good pleasure of his will. <laughs> God is very pleased with what he wills. Some point, one place, Paul said, God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's a pleasing thought to God. That's a pleasing thought. Because God doesn't take the delight in the death of the wicked. That doesn't please God. God wasn't pleased when he destroyed the people in the flood. This didn't bring pleasure to God. God had a purpose so that would bring him pleasure. But unless this thing at the flood, unless that situation was judged by God, nobody would ever be able to understand his will. Because it would be this distorted view of sin, that he tolerates sin, and he doesn't tolerate sin. This way you see the enormity of that. Now, this is just the sin of the people up to Noah's day. That's just, just up to Noah's day. And look what happened. Now take all the sins of the world from the Garden of Eden to the end of the world and see if you can picture them being laid on Christ, the whole thing. It's incomprehensible. But it had to be done for God to do what he really wanted to do. So if there's any question about whether God wants to save people or not, there should be no question about this. Amen. Yes, Brother John. At the cross, when Jesus said, well, when he was um, preparing for the cross, he said, not my will, but thine be done. Yeah. His will was done. Is what he wanted to do. That's right. The good pleasure of his will. It was John who said, I think it's in the third chapter, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him.
Well, that's a simple, straightforward statement. But it doesn't mean much until you know what God wills. <laughs> if, you, if it is true that God wants you rich and healthy, healthy and wealthy, if that's true, this complicates things because most of the people in the world are neither rich nor wealthy <laughs> or healthy. Yeah, that's just the way it is. But God has something higher in mind. When you know it, how it pleases God, then you begin to live in conformity with that. Now all of a sudden you think about Christ coming, it doesn't scare you. I can remember when it scared me as a young boy. Christ coming. Used to be preachers preached a little bit more about it. It did scare me. Christ coming, the end of the world, they'd paint these pictures, boy. People calling out for rocks and mountains to fall on them. The world falling apart. Stars falling from heaven. Sun and the moon refuse to shine. Boy, it's a frightening. See, these are very real things that are going to happen. It frightened me. But now that I have a little better understanding of what God's really doing, now those same facts make me joyful. Amen. Yeah. Now I'm glad to hear about it because God's people are going to survive all this. This isn't going to affect God's people. Amen. He's just going to take them unto himself. Uh -huh. Israel said, stop speaking. When Moses heard God speak, he said, show me your glory. Show me, yeah. Yeah, show me your glory. God's intentions, the good pleasure of his will. God's will is very satisfying to himself. Yeah. Now listen, God's intention is not to damn people. Although some are going to be damned. He that believeth not, shall be damned. See, so that is, God is going to damn some people. But that's not what his purpose is. His purpose is loftier. God is revealing in salvation, he's revealing his grace, even though his wrath is revealed in the gospel, but it's as it was poured out on Christ. That's, it's revealed in what God did to Christ, not in what God does to you. <laughs> See, in the gospel is revealed the wrath of God. Therein is revealed the wrath of God against all ungodliness of men. Because he, because he cursed Christ. But the will of God concerning you is that you might be his adopted son and live with him forever. Let it be clear from the viewpoint of our text that the driving objective of God was not to smite Jesus, even though he did. But the objective was to free the children, which smiting Jesus was a requisite to freeing the children. Now, what are the implications of this truth? God has revealed his, uh, the mystery of his will. It is that our primary purpose for embracing Christ is not to escape condemnation. Although we do flee for refuge to him. We talk about the primary reason now. The primary reason is we have fled to him for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. That's the objective. Amen. That's the objective for you to be dominated by what God has revealed he's going to do at last with his people. He's going to give them the kingdom, they're going to reign forever, they're going to be with him forever, and in view of that, if you really believe that, you will change the way you live. That's just the way it is. There's coming a time when the saints will be like their Savior. That's God's will. We, we acknowledge now there's a part of us in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. But the saints are not going to say that on the other side. Amen. Then's when the purpose, the mystery of his will is going to be. That's where God's going with this. God is going, you're going to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And what those who believe that are, they're doing their best to be without it now. They're doing the best they can to be without spot or wrinkle now. But they also are honest with you. They haven't got rid of all the spots and wrinkles yet. But they're going to go. 
And if you live in anticipation of them going, I tell you, God will bless you in your efforts. Amen. God is determined. He's going to praise you. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, Then shall every man receive praise from God. That's going to be worth it. Whatever, whatever you had to go through. Yes. When you hear God before an assembled universe, he praises you. Says, well done, good and faithful servant. Calls you by your name. You check your stone. Ask me. You'll, be, you'll not regret. You live for him. Daniel said the saints are going to take the kingdom. It's going to be given to them. Jesus said, it's my father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We don't have it now. I mean, we've been translated into it, but we can't, we can't make things happen on the earth now. If we did, the earthly circumstances would provide an ideal situation for these people that their word makes things happen. There's a lot of things we wish they'd address with their word and solve. But see, they're liars. They're not telling the truth. They don't have any more power than you got. Probably less. The time is coming when the saints are going to judge the world until then we're the ones being judged. <laughs> People judge us. They malign your motives. They question your integrity, whatever. We're going to judge the world and angels, 1 Corinthians 6 says. So the need for knowing these things, it's all under the category of the mystery of his will. The need for knowing these things is seen in the fact that living for this world is a too low of a motive is too low. It's not, it's, it's not powerful enough to provide the incentive you need to make it through. You get discouraged too easily if you set your hope on good things here. We're not talking about sinful things. You set your mind on good things here and the good comforts and just all this sort of thing, but it's, it doesn't give you enough strength to press through Amen. some of the difficulties You'll find out that no person who's motivated by it like that will rejoice in the person of God. They'll just praise God for what they see he did for them, whatever it was. But we joy in God, in the person of God. Why? Because we we're beginning to see him more clearly. How gracious he really is, more gracious than I used to think. I didn't know he was as gracious as he is. But now I'm beginning to get the picture. I'm more forward now to come to him for grace, for mercy, and find grace to help in a time of need because I see this. The intent of the verse does not appear to be the means by which God would carry out his purpose in Christ. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it removes it from you, but then you are in Christ. He carries his purpose out in Christ. That is, Christ is the ingredient that causes things to start and be completed. Christ is. Where Christ is, the work will start and the work will be finished. Where Christ isn't, it's another story. Uh -huh. Thus, the objective, according to God's purpose, is said to be to conform the predestinated ones to the image of his son. That's Romans 8, 29, 28 and 30, 29, 28 and 29. The purpose of God is also said to stand, the purpose of God stands according to election. Yeah. That's Romans 9, 11. And God called us by his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, 2 Timothy 1.9. All of this is saying the same thing our text says. He's made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure of his will in Christ Jesus. He's made that known to us. Now the next phase of the operation is, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. And it's a wonderful, wonderful message. This causes Romans 12, 2 to kind of come alive. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, holy meaning completely, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, that ye might prove or find out for yourself what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the mystery of, <laughs> mystery of his will. And in the light of that knowledge, you'll be able to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. I think I'll close there, brethren. And if you have a word you'd like to add? Chapter 3, Paul's going to mention the fellowship of the missionary. Yeah. Amen. And the, that word fellowship there is uh, administration. Administration, yeah. And Jesus, it's, God has made Jesus the custodian Amen. Of, this, of the mystery. It's not just um, public, publicly accessible. It's revealed to those to whom it is given. And it remains a mystery to everyone else. Amen. Anyone else tonight? Sister Melissa? thinking about when he, he makes known this uh, mystery of his will this is how he administers grace to us That's right. as uh, we know it made me think about when I was quite a bit younger when I first started in management and I when I learned why I had to do certain things or what the purpose was for those things it, it made me able yeah. to do them and able to uh, manage things and also God makes us able Whenever he um, reveals this mystery of his will, it, it gives us ability to move about in the kingdom and to be able to, um, you know, to love God more. Amen. Because he's the only one that really has a perfect pleasure and a perfect will. And uh, we get to see more of him of that so that, that we want to, to do the Amen. things that he wants us to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Michael. God's, <coughs> God's will is made known to us as he works in us because God doesn't yeah. reveal anything apart from what he does. That's right. But Adam, Adam and Eve didn't get Revelation chapters 20 and 21. That wasn't for them. That was, God had to do a whole lot of work before something like that could be revealed. And the, this is uh, one of the ways that he makes, makes his will known to us is by our own experience. Mm -hmm. That is him working in us. That's mm -hmm. the experience that I'm talking about, Christ working in us. Just for example, like the <clears throat> the struggle between the the new creation and the old man. That's something that you that that all of us experienced before we understood what it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Lord opened it up yeah. to us. Amen. Amen. Yeah. There's a, a a definite correlation between what God reveals and, and his working. He doesn't mm -hmm. reveal apart from what he's worked in. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Ricky. Appreciate what you said about these things not just kind of being automatic. Uh -huh. Whether we're talking about the revelation of these things and the outworking of these things, last week you uh, you articulated the fact that the grace of God is toward us. The emphasis is upon God has made the grace available to us, mm -hmm. and now <coughs> you enter into it. Mm -hmm. So, in some sense, everyone kind of charts how much they receive based That's on right. how much they're Amen. giving themselves to Amen. the into these things. Write your own ticket, so to speak. <laughs> it's only totally right that God be the one with the free will. Yeah. Yes, Because he's is. always going to do what is right. Yeah. Amen. Now, Amen. Maybe, maybe, if we want to talk about free will, maybe after we've been after. fully redeemed and after we've been brought into one, maybe... When we can be counted on to always do what's right, yeah. then perhaps we may we can think about uh, giving you a little free will now. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, we'll have a closing word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the revelation of the mystery of your will, that you have not continued to keep this secret. And we're thankful that salvation leaves you righteous in saving us and ridding us of our iniquity, translating us unto the kingdom of your dear Son, and delivering us from the power of righteousness. We thank you that this is right for it to be done, and that no devil in hell can contradict it or take it from us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.